A motor unit consists of a motor neuron plus all the skeletal muscle fibers it stimulates. A single motor neuron may make contact with an average of about 150 muscle cells or muscle fibers, and all those cells in one motor unit contract together in unison. Whole muscles that control precise movements consist of many small motor units. For instance, the muscles that control the larynx or the voice box have as few as two or three muscle fibers per muscle unit, and muscles controlling eye movements may have 10 or 20 muscle fibers per motor unit. Skeletal muscles responsible for large-scale and really powerful movements, such as contracting your biceps brachii in the arm or the gastrocnemius muscle in the calf, that big muscle, may have as many as two, two to three thousand muscle fibers in some of the muscle units. Because all of the muscle fibers of a unit have to contract and relax together, the total strength of the contraction depends on the size of the motor units and the number that are activated at any given time. Even when a skeletal muscle is at rest, it exhibits what we call muscle tone or a small amount of tension in the muscle due to weak and involuntary contractions of its motor units. Muscle tone helps to keep muscle firm, but it doesn't result in a force strong enough to produce movement. For example, when you're awake, the muscles in the back of the neck are in a normal what we call tonic contraction. They keep the head upright and prevent it from being slumped over on your chest. So the, the tone of muscles helps to keep the body in position and upright. Because muscle contraction is a change in electrical activity across a membrane, we can measure that on a graphical uh, drawing that we call a myogram. So a twitch is the brief contraction of all muscle fibers in a motor unit in response to a single action potential in its motor neuron. So the stimulus occurs here. Now we're looking at force of contraction across time in milliseconds. So a stimulus is applied and then there's what we call a latent period. A latent period is that brief little period of milliseconds during which depolarization has to occur. So the action potential is, is propagating over the sarcolemma and the calcium ions are being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. reticulum. And then we have the contraction period, which is a greater, of course, force of contraction over time. So the contraction period is where the cross bridges form. So that's going to be when you've got the calcium bound to the troponin and the binding sites are open and those cross bridges form. So the peak tension develops in the muscle fiber during this time. Now, if the stimulus has stopped, remember then the muscle is going to relax as the calcium is pumped back out of the sarcoplasm and into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when a muscle fiber has been stimulated enough to contract, there's a temporary time in there where it loses its ability to respond. That's when we call uh, that muscle being in a refractory period. So this is common. That's uh, this is something that's common to all muscle cells and neurons. So basically, if you think of a refractory period as like when you flush your toilet, you can't immediately go back and flush the toilet again. It has to have a period to reset or refill with water. Well, same thing with your muscle cells and your neurons. They have to repolarize or get back to that state of depolar of being polarized across the membrane in order to be able to respond again. Okay, so remember here in this image, we're looking at a myogram of a twitch, a motor unit response to a single action potential. Now, we have what is known as graded responses that provide smooth muscle contractions that vary in strength. So there's two ways of response being graded. You either change the frequency of the stimulation, as we're going to look at on this slide, or change the strength of the stimulation, as we'll see on the next. So when we have a twitch, this is what we saw on the previous slide. So a single uh, motor unit responding to a single action potential. Sometimes, though, a second stimulus occurs after the refractory period of the first stimulus, but before the skeletal muscle fiber has completely relaxed. So a second contraction will actually be stronger than the first. And here's what we see there, and we call that wave summation. 
when a skeletal muscle, muscle fiber is stimulated 20 to 30 times a second, it can only partially relax between the stimuli, and the result is sort of a wavering contraction that we have here, and we call that an unfused tetanus. Now, we're not talking about tetanus like lockjaw. This is tetanus in refer, referring to the way that muscles are contracting. Wave summation that comes in at 80 to 100 times per second, the skeletal muscle can't relax at all. So this is what we call a fused summation. And you can see that the faster the action potentials are coming in, the greater that stimulus, the muscle is not, or the greater that force of contraction, the muscle is not relaxing at all. So you have the um, much, much greater force of contraction there with the tetanus. And then we have graded responses in what we call strength or in the amount of muscle fibers that are being used. So recruitment is when we stimulate more motor units and that of course is going to control the force of contraction. So the process in which more active motor units is recruited, obviously, recruitment. So typically the different motor units of an entire muscle are not stimulated to contract at the same time. While some are contracting, others are relaxed. This helps the muscle not to fatigue as quickly and also allows for contraction of the whole muscle during sustained periods of activity. The weakest motor units are typically recruited first with progressively stronger motor units added if we need more force for the job at hand. So recruitment is one factor that's responsible for producing really smooth movements instead of a series of jerks. So here you can see small fibers recruited first in the first motor unit and if the tension remains we recruit even more motor units and then more over a period of time. A couple of things to be aware of. One is the concept of a threshold stimulus. So a threshold stimulus is the amount of stimulus where the muscle first responds to that stimulus with the first contraction. So if you look at this image, we're looking at an increase of stimulus voltage versus the stimulus, uh, the response of the nerve, okay? So as the stimulus increases, you're going to see more and more uh, increase in the arrows here, I guess you could say. So the threshold stimulus is here. So the muscle is not even responding, as you can see down here in this graphic, no response at all of the muscle until the stimulus is reached. And look at what's going on with the number of motor units. No motor units, no motor units. Why? Because the muscle is not responding to that sub-threshold sub stimulus. But once the threshold stimulus, the right voltage has been hit. Now what do we mean by voltage? Remember we're talking about the flow of ions across the membrane, right? So once the cell has depolarized enough, there's enough stimulus a small number of motor units will be excited and on a myogram you see just a small deflection on the wave. Not a whole lot of contraction. But as that stimulus increases and increases and increases, you can see that more and more motor units are being recruited and you see more and more contraction up until the point where we reach maximum, maximal contraction because we've reached maximal stimulus. So all of the motor units are being excited and recruited and we've reached maximal, or, I'm sorry, maximal contraction. That muscle can't contract, can't relax, can't reset, can't respond anymore to the stimulus. All right, so let's look briefly at some terminology associated with contractions. So tension is the force exerted by a muscle and load is the force exerted on a muscle. For instance, if you pick up your weights when you're exercising, that is your load. The tension is what is being exerted by the muscle to hold that weight up. So we'll look at two different types of contractions, isotonic and isometric. Muscle contractions can be either isotonic or isometric. Isotonic contractions are used for body movements and for moving things. Two types of isotonic contractions are concentric and eccentric. Concentric isotonic contraction, the muscle fiber shortens and pulls on another structure. For example, if you're picking a book up from a table, that involves concentric 
isotonic contractions of the biceps brachii in the arm. By contrast, if you lower the book and place it back on the table, that muscle that you previously shortened, the biceps brachii, is then going to lengthen in a very controlled manner while it continues to remain contracted. The length of the muscle increases during the contraction. That means the contract contraction is an eccentric isotonic. So concentric, picking something up and shortening the muscle. Eccentric, keeping that muscle contracted but lowering or decreasing the angle. An isometric contraction is when the length of the muscle doesn't change. Isometric, same length. An example would be just holding that book steady using your arm outstretched. These contractions, of course, are going to be important for maintaining posture and supporting objects into a fixed position. Even though that isometric contractions don't result in body movement, we're still using energy because it requires ATP, remember, for muscles to contract. So the book's pulling downward on the arm, stretching the shoulder and the arm muscles. The isometric contraction of the shoulder and the arm counteracts the stretch. So isometric contractions are important because they help to stabilize some joints while other joints are moved. However, most activities of the body include both isotonic and isometric contractions.